everybody. So uh, I'm really pleased to be able to talk about this because the, uh, the standard is something that I've been working on for a very, very long time and it's nice to see that it's actually uh, going to become a reality. Uh, over the years I've talked a lot about solar eclipse eye injuries and how to prevent them. We know that the uh, basic mechanism for the damage uh, involves a photochemical process which affects the back of the eye and we call it photochemical retinopathy. And uh, one of the things that we know about this is that uh, one of the triggers for this is not just a one-shot deal, but rather the fact that during the uh, eclipse observations, people are making either sustained or repeated uh, uh, glimpses at the sun unprotected. And uh, particularly, of course, during the partial uh, phases is when the damage is done. And unlike a lot of my colleagues who think it's the total uh, phase that's damaging, of course, it's the partial one that is. Uh, we also know that uh, one of the vexing things from a clinical point of view is that uh, even when we know that this thing has happened, uh, our problem is being able to predict what happens to the patient who has been uh, affected because the uh, way that they present is very variable and the way that they recover is very variable. And we really cannot predict anything on the basis of the one uh, view we see immediately after the event. All we know is that they looked at the eclipse, they fried their eyes, and the next morning they look across the breakfast table at their near and dear one and can't see their faces. And um, at that point they come in to see us and uh, everything ensues. So our problem then is really to try and predict who we should be warning about this, and it turns out to be a uh, typical patient is this profile here, which is a very, very difficult uh, type of person to deal with. <laughs> uh, and most of us who have had adolescent sons know exactly what I'm talking about. I'll leave that be. But in any case, uh, we also know that there are some things that we have to keep consistently warning people about, and that is that there is this latent period the uh, affected part of the retina is essentially a dead man walking after the event for about 12 to 48 hours. There's no pain sensation in, uh, associated with it, so uh, they don't know that they've hurt themselves until uh, way into the process. And of course, the longer you delay uh, any kind of uh, type of treatment, um, which is very limited anyway, uh, the less likely you are to have success in uh, dealing with it. So. Lots of problems involved with dealing with these kinds of things. Again, it is a photochemical mechanism. We've talk, uh, I've talked about this a lot over the years. Uh, we do know from experimental uh, uh, runs on uh, both humans and animals that there isn't a great deal of energy that's required, although this is a fairly uh, large amount of energy compared to a lot of the sources that we're familiar with. And I will say that last night um, I had a really nice experience after Franklin got that uh, cap with the LEDs in it. Uh, he sat down at the table and inadvertently flashed me. And uh, those three LEDs, point blank, left a, an after image in my eyes for about 10 minutes. Uh, and frankly, when we evaluate LEDs, we consider them lasers and we classify them accordingly. And that particular one probably is a class 3B type laser, which means uh, it is a retinal hazard if you look directly at it. I don't encourage using that thing. Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, the other thing is we've got thermal uh, type injuries that are sometimes associated particularly with looking at uh, the sun through a telescope or a camera. Again, the th it's called thermal because what it's dealing with is transduction of the light energy into heat at the retina. It's not actually infrared that is doing the job. And we've got plenty of evidence to show that over the years from experimentation. And again, the problem is, I think, using the word thermal, people think that it is infrared or heat that's doing the, uh, the damage. And yes, infrared can uh, damage the eye, but 
you can see that the energy that we require to get a clinically detectable uh, damage at the retina is about four orders of magnitude greater than what we need in the visible wavelengths. So uh, it's a very much inefficient process, and you have to be using a class four type laser in order to uh, get this kind of damage to occur. Well, the longest story comes to an end after the 1999 eclipse over Europe, where there was a lot of concern about eye safety. And um, the uh, Comité uh, Européen uh, des Normes, or CEN as we like to call them because it's too hard to talk about the uh, French full name, decided that they should react to it as quickly as possible and produce a standard. Well, they had an existing standard, 1836, which dealt with sunglasses, and so they just tacked it on as an afterthought. So the title is now Non-Prescription uh, Sunglasses and Filters for Direct Observation of the Sun. And this is actually really quite impressive. They got it done, you know, started in 2000 after the fact, and they published it in 2005. So CEN moved with lightning speed to get this thing out. Um, and the, the, the nice thing about this is because solar filters are a personal protective item specifically for direct observation of the sun, they fall under this Council Directive 89-686, which governs all personal protective equipment that is marketed or imported into the European community. It gives governments the right to block non-compliant products before they even cross into the community, and it gives them the right to seize and destroy non-compliant materials if they are found in the community. It has the force of law. And so uh, it's nice that solar filters fall into this because we now have some legislative hooks. And it is a mandatory compliance because it's declared as a self-protective device. So uh, 1836 uh, was used for the first time um, to certify uh, materials uh, uh, for solar filter glasses, eclipse glasses, and so on for the uh, 2012 uh, November total solar eclipse. Here's the view on one of the products that was produced by uh, Thousand Oaks Optical and Rainbow Symphony showing that it indeed meets the standard. And I was uh, helpful in getting a, a colleague uh, in Sydney to actually set up his lab to do the certification at the time. So we had this moving along, but we had a problem, and that is that the terms of the E in 1836 are basically set up um, according to uh, the uh, standards for welding filters and, and similar products. And I'll show you why that's a problem as we move ahead. Uh, one of the things that's happened over the years is that CEN and the International Standards Organization have been working together to take the European standards, which are basically a regional kind of standards mechanism, and turn them into international or global standards. So the ISO standards uh, really can be enforced anywhere in, around the world as long as the country uh, is a signatory to ISO. And um, as a result, the um, TC94, the Technical Committee 94, Subcommittee 6 on Eye Protection, was tasked with the job of producing a replacement for EN uh, 1836. And I happen to be the Canadian delegate uh, to that particular committee, so when I'm there I am the government of Canada, which is an interesting position to be in. And, um, uh, and so I was the lead writer for this particular standard. And um, one of the attractions about this is that ISO and uh, CEN have an agreement called the Vienna Agreement, which allows for us to develop ISO standards which automatically then get confirmed as European standards and withdraw the uh, corresponding EN document. So we do have to uh, move with this very, very carefully in order to uh, comply with the Council Directive. Well, the result of that was that uh, we had to do an analysis of radiation hazards. And so here's um, your typical solar spectrum that's produced by uh, uh, various types of instruments. This is still the standard reference document even though NASA has produced uh, additional uh, uh, data over the years, the moon document from 1940 still stands fairly well. And uh, what you find is that out of this spectrum, what we need to do is really look from about 
280 nanometers over to 1400 nanometers because this is the wave band of optical radiation that can actually penetrate the eye to the retina. Anything longer or shorter than that really gets stopped by the front of the eye and uh, we don't need to worry about it in terms of eclipse damage. Now the welding sources that um, we've used in the past as the basis for standards uh, really come in uh, two different varieties. And let's see if we can get the you know, thing to come up. Okay, so here's one of them. This is a thermal lance. It's basically a very souped up oxyacetylene torch. And you can see me there over uh, on the side with my computer measuring the radiation coming off of this baby. Uh, this is the kind of thing they use to cut the slag out of the um, uh, coke ovens and the, um, uh, you know, the steel uh, factories. And they'll use one of these things for about six weeks to cut out a room about the size of this assembly hall that's full of slag. Lots of heat generated in that. But this is the typical spectrum that you get. So there's a lot of visible light flare here, a uh, little bit around here, uh, and you'll recognize that uh, there's a bit of sodium in that, uh, and a few other things. But basically, it's pretty flat out here in the infrared, very, very low, and over here in the ultraviolet, there's nothing. We compare that to an electric welding arc, and here's a number of different types of uh, uh, high voltage, high current uh, welding arcs. And here we have an entirely different kind of uh, uh, hazard. You again see that there's a lot of lines in the visible that are going to contribute to the visible flare that we all know and love from these things. But look over here in the ultraviolet. This is what causes flash burns or welder's arc flash. Uh, it's all these lines over here, particularly in the UVC and the UVB. And um, there's enough in the UVC here at these uh, at these very, very high uh, emission levels that, you know, the normal air column that we rely on to block UVC is pretty much ineffective. So this is the kind of thing that we're working with. And down here in the infrared, again, there's a few lines, but they're much, much uh, less intense than what we're getting over in the ultraviolet. And as we go longer than that, uh, they also disappear quite, a, uh, quite uh, nicely. So it's a very, very different kind of filtering, which begs the question, why do we always talk about welding filters originally as the uh, protective um, uh, gear? And it's because in the 1950s, when people started to really get um, interested in trying as amateur astronomers to look at the sun, welding filters were the only technology available that would cut the visible light glare. It just happened that there was the ultraviolet and infrared protections as well but they were not germane to the issue really. And it's taken us about half a century to realize that officially. So the result was that um, as we moved ahead with the development of the ISO standard, we had to put out a rationale that would satisfy the European uh, community. So David Sliney, who is a, an old friend and colleague from the US Aberdeen uh, Proving Grounds of the US Army, uh, and I wrote this rationale. And, uh, since we're both uh, considered the leading experts on uh, radiation eye damage in the world, I think it will stick, at least I hope it will. But if, essentially what we argued was that we really need to just provide the protection for the visible ranges to prevent phototoxic injuries, and that solar IR and UV are basically insignificant uh, players. And the only thing we really need to do is make sure that we've got the visible light coverage uh, for the protectors. So the result is that we have a much um, different standard from what we have seen uh, previously <clears throat> in that we have much less requirements for the ultraviolet and the infrared. They're much more forgiving. So for example, 3% in the infrared, whereas with most of the um, uh, welding filters, um, at least with North American standards, we're about two orders of magnitude below that. The Europeans, funnily enough, are allowing up to 12% in the infrared for modern welding filters. So uh, again, it's a, a, a drastic divergence from uh, what is out there right now. Now since then, we've also had some interesting technical developments, and I, I brought along some goodies, uh, some first crack looks at some of the new filter uh, gears that are going to be available for 2017. 
So for example, um, Rainbow Symphony has come out with something to replace the paper um, eclipse glasses we know and love so well, and we have the designer sunglass. So there we are, and uh, that's the uh, transmission curve for this lens. It's basically a stiffened black polymer lens in a plastic frame, so it'll stand up a little bit nicer uh, than the old one. And also an experimental wraparound type for anybody who's concerned about being distracted by things from the side. And so we have the wraparound. This one is a prototype. I can't see a bloody thing in it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so this is the other model that's coming out, uh, probably again in time for 2017. My biggest fear is that people will mistake these for driving sunglasses and try to <laughs> hunt the... Uh, eclipse on the interstate with these things on. Uh, so that is a problem. Uh, the other thing that's happened is that Rainbow Symphony has uh, uh, had uh, Pat Steele of Thousand Oaks reconfigure the, uh, the sheet, make it a, a little bit uh, stiffer uh, for uh, some do-it-yourself applications. And uh, this is just to demonstrate that, in fact, the uh, curve is very, very similar to what I've published previously for the more flimsy uh, sheet material that you've probably tried to use to make up your own solar filters. So um, they're coming along very nicely with this with uh, uh, different types of models of um, filters to address a number of different markets. Since then, in fact, uh, at the beginning of the month, Pat Steele emailed me to say that he was sending me another prototype, which is going to be a black polymer flimsy that has an aluminum surface on it. And this is to address uh, some concerns by authorities elsewhere about the infrared, even though we know it's not a problem, but from a regulatory uh, viewpoint, we need to address that. So uh, there is going to be a black polymer sheet that has a single aluminized surface on it that uh, will be coming out as well in time, maybe for 2016, but certainly for 2017. So things are moving along in the filter technology area. As far as the schedule is concerned, um, the draft um, uh, went to what was called a final draft international standard vote in the fall of 2014 and passed. And so um, the, uh, the ballot was confirmed at the uh, ISO technical committee meeting in Paris last week. And uh, so we should be seeing 12312-2 uh, uh, published by uh, ISO later in this year, and concurrently with that, uh, CEN is going to withdraw the EN 1836, which will end the confusion over solar filters. So um, it's a nice way to conclude about 25 years of work to see this thing out. And now all we have to do is make sure that these babies comply. So uh, the work continues. So I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Um, in fact, that's one of the things that uh, I get to do a lot is uh, take a look at fried eyeballs. And yes, the, uh, if, if there is damage there, we can see it. Yeah. And uh, the photographs that I put up earlier uh, are of uh, typical types of presentations. Okay. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, the idea is that um, in order for these products to be marketed in um, Europe, they will have to be labeled, so they will have to go through compliance testing, and uh, that isn't cheap. But uh, Pat Steele and um, uh, uh, Mark Margolis have been very, very diligent about getting their products tested because they know what the stakes are. Um, I also know Thomas Botter um, of Botter, uh, Germany, who uh, is also an old acquaintance, and we've been in communication about this as well. So I expect that all of the major players will uh, present their stuff for compliance testing over the next six months. Yeah. Frank? Yeah. 
they meet the previous uh, 1836 standards, so they're still good. Uh, the thing is that what this does is uh, handle um, compliance testing for future production. So anything that's out there right now um, would comply anyway, but uh, I expect that what will happen is that there isn't a great deal of stock left, um, and we're really dealing with brand new products, not the stuff that you've been hoarding in your uh, observing kit. Um, it's not going to change the properties. It's just simply that from a marketing point of view and liability for the, uh, the sellers of the product, the standard basically provides an additional layer of protection. Yeah. Found notes is slightly better, mm -hmm. and the matter is slightly sharper. Where does this yeah. stuff fall in that continuum? Okay. Uh, what we are talking about is really materials that are intended for use in eclipse glasses. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, protective filters that go on uh, the front of telescopes, th that is not a personal protective device. That is um, an accessory for a scientific instrument and is exempt from this standard. It's not covered. Uh, what we're dealing with is specifically what can be legally defined as personal protective equipment. Yeah, but when I look through those, is it going to be sharper than if I'm using a microfilter? Ah, okay. That's a different question. Um, yeah. Well, there is provision in the main uh, ISO 12312 for optical quality. Uh, we've exempted these filters from that requirement because of the fact that the test equipment is incapable of measuring anything with an optical density greater than 2.5, uh, which translates into about 0 0.5% uh, uh, transmission or thereabouts. Uh, and these things in the visible are much, much denser than that. Uh, however, uh, we know that the specific solar filter materials from Botter and Thousand Oaks uh, will meet the optical requirements of a class two device easily. Um, welder's glass, on the other hand, um, is pretty bad, especially the glass filters. And uh, while they're suitable for visible use, we certainly have never advocated their use for, uh, with telescopes simply because of the poor optics. So thanks. Thank you very much, Ralph. That was a, a, a great presentation. Thanks.